Good morning and welcome to Recipe for Success. My name is Nancy Giacalone and our guest this week is Susan Combs. If you've never joined us before, the premise behind Recipe for Success is it really combines my love of cooking with my love of business and entrepreneurship and just many other things. Because one of the things that I found um, when I was in the kitchen was that there was always one key ingredient or technique that was absolutely critical to the outcome or the success of the recipe. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that same thing was true in business and in life. So again, I'd like to welcome Susan Combs to our show. She is the owner and founder of Combs and Company, an insurance and employee benefits agency, and she's also a recently published author. So welcome, Susan. I'd like to um, have you introduce yourself as well. Tell, tell us a little bit about your background um, and your career history. Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Nancy. So I, like you said, I have a full service insurance brokerage firm in New York City. Um, I've been out here for a little over 20 years, um, but I'm originally from a town of about a thousand people in the Northwest corner of Missouri. So a <laughs> big difference from, from New York to Missouri for sure. And I've had my firm, um, I guess going on 17 years now. And when I started the firm, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I knew how to treat people well and my background's hospitality. And so we really made sure that the insurance workers firm was a service model and that it was, you know, it was friendly, it was warm, it was informative. And so that's kind of how we started. Um, I started out on the employee benefits side and then, um, like I said, we're full service. So we do property and casualty. We do a lot of consulting. And then I personally do a lot of expert witnessing all across the country on the Affordable Care Act. And then, as you said, I'm a recently published author. So we add that to the list as well. Well, that is so cool. Um, of course, I know you from the insurance industry um, and our many associations, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But today we're really going to focus on your recently published book called Pancakes for Rogers. Hold it up, Susan. Yes. yes um, yeah. A mentorship <laughs> guide for slaying dragons. OK, so um, it's an awesome cover. Um, but I have to say, I don't usually associate pancakes <laughs> with mentorship, and I certainly don't associate, associate them with dragons. So tell us a little bit about um, the book and then how you came up with the title. Gotcha. So the one of the things that I've been very fortunate to have is I've had a lot of great mentors in my life. I mean, ever since I was a little girl to currently. And um, I have people that mentor me, people that I mentor, and I have peer-to-peer -peer mentors. I mean, you know, truth be told, Nancy is one of my peer-to-peer -peer mentors that I can, <laughs> we have a, a, a text thread that uh, has a group of us on there and we need to bounce ideas off of each other from time to time. And I think those are some of the best mentors you can have. But I realize that not everybody has those great mentors. Not everybody has those great sounding boards, if you will. And when I publicly speak, I have typically ended my talks with unsolicited advice. And so they're kind of quick hit quotes. And I give a little bit of fun antidote about the person and, and pass along the wisdom that I've gotten. And I always thought it would be kind of cool to turn it into a book. So when COVID happened, I had a lot of people when there was a lot more Zoom, <laughs> Zoom meetings. And I had a lot of women that kept encouraging me, encouraging me, encouraging me. And so I said, you know what, why not now? And with the the title, um, Pancakes for Roger, um, it's really a tribute piece to my, my late father. I lost my father about three years ago to Agent Orange related throat cancer. And um, the last late year of his life, he had a feeding tube and he was on oxygen um, towards the end. And if you've ever dealt with anybody on a feeding tube or on oxygen, um, if their oxygen gets low, there can be confusion and all of their nutrition has to go through the feeding tube. And I was fortunate enough to be able to move back to Missouri and help care for my father towards the end of his life. And I um, am an avid CrossFitter and an avid um, religious type A personality, if you know me. And so very scheduled. My father was a two-star general in the Air Force. And he was also a civilian judge. And so my father was very regimented. That's where I come by it naturally. So the, the title um, comes from an interaction that I had with him. Um, so I would get up at five in the morning. I would check on him. I'd go to the gym, do my CrossFit workout. I'd come back, check on him again. If he was good to go, I would take a shower and then I'd come down and help him with his tube feeding. And then we'd just start the day. Um, one morning when I was coming down from taking a shower, he had beat me to the table and he was setting the table. 
And if you have a feeding tube, usually you're not setting the table. So I knew that there was something up with his oxygen. And I looked at him, I said, dad, what are you doing? And he said, well, I'm, I'm setting the table. He said, I want pancakes for breakfast. And oh man, it just shattered me. It just, it broke my heart because this man had never asked for anything. I mean, he would, we're a food family and he never complained about having a feeding tube. He just knew that's how it was. And I looked at him and I said, oh dad, there's nothing in the world more than I want to give you than pancakes. But we, you know, you have a feeding tube, we have a DNR because you're on hospice. And if you choke, we're done here. And I just don't think we're ready to be done here yet. And he, you know, he said, oh yes, I can. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, the general has spoken, right? And yes. um, my brother, Matt's a nurse. And my dad said, Matt said, Matt said I could have pancakes. And it, Matt wasn't there that day. So I knew the oxygen level had gotten low and he was having some confusion. And so I looked at him, I said, well, let me see what I could do. So I took the, um, he always liked his tube feeding warmed up for 14 seconds, not 13, not 15, but 14, 14, 14 on the dot. And, um, so I took the Pyrex pitcher over, warmed it up for 14 seconds, brought it over the table and I put it on the table and he says, what's that? And I said, well, that's your syrup. And so his auction levels were kind of rallying around. He kind of smiled at me and kind of understood. And he's like, okay. So fast forward a couple of weeks later when my father did pass away, um, I, I shared the story and I took one day off of work when I came back to New York and my husband said, you know what, let's go have some pancakes for your dad. And so I shared that on social media. We had the first picture at the Bel Air Diner in Astoria, Queens, and uh, said, you know, if you're so inclined to have some pancakes for Roger, because at the end of the day, it's all about the little things in life. And we never know when the little things can be taken away, like just enjoying a stack of pancakes. So that's where the whole premise behind Pancakes for Roger started. And then it's kind of turned into this whole movement um, for the month of February. My dad's birthday is in February. So every, it, the month of February, following his passing for every picture we get on social media using the hashtag pancakes for Roger, then my company makes a donation to the university of Missouri law school veterans clinic that provides free legal services for our veterans and their families navigating the VA claim system and appeals process. So that's how like the, the main portion of the, um, the title got started. And then when we were working on this, we knew it was about mentorship. We knew it was about guidance. So originally the, the title was, you know, a mentorship guide for life. And then about 2 a.m., I woke up one day and I was like, freaking slaying dragons. We got to slay some dragons. How do we work this? How do we work this? And I was like, it's a mentorship guide for slaying dragons. And I remember talking to my team and uh, because this was right when we were getting started. And um, a woman I was working with, she's like, I don't get it. I'm, I'm not sure I'm there. And I said, you will. You, if, you, if you know me, you know this is an appropriate title. So I tested it on some friends and I was like, what do you guys think about this? And they were like, oh, it's a badass title. So it's kind of funny because after the book came out, I worked with a company called Scribe that did um, the publishing and the, and the PR around it. And when they release a new book, they put it on their team Slack. And I guess they normally, people don't say anything about titles. And then everybody was chomping at the bit, man, this, this title's it. This is it. So I think we, we did right by it. I love the cover because I like the fact that the pancakes are bigger than the dragon. And I yeah. think, um, you know, it, to me, that's just a metaphor that our dragons are big in our head than they are actually in real life. So I, I do, I do love that. So you, you touched a little bit about your dad, but I mean, he had a very rich and storied career um, that impacted so many people, but I really want to know how he impacted you and your life. Ooh, um, <laughs> and I'm going to try not to cry because I was almost yeah. crying during the last time you were talking. Yeah. And I've read the book, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we're a member of the same club that nobody yeah. wants to join. And, you know, my, my dad, you know, he was just one of those guys. He was good when nobody was watching. And um, we don't, I don't think we realized his reach until after he passed. And I had so many people that still to this day, I mean, I was interviewed on veterans radio, I, week or two ago. And I had a guy that emailed me after that interview saying, oh, your dad helped me when I was, you know, a brand new F-16 pilot saying there's, there's rocks in the clouds and always be aware of what's, what's in the clouds. There's rocks in the clouds. And this guy went on to be a flight instructor. And he said, every single class I taught got that wisdom from Roger Combs. And so stories like that just warm my heart. And, you know, he was, um, you know, one of the biggest lessons my dad always taught me is it's important for you to be understood, but it's more important for you not to be misunderstood. And so even though my father had a lot of big accolades, I mean, he's got a four page Wikipedia page, he's gotten a lot of awards, he's highly decorated, you know, in his judgeship and also as being a general, 
he always stayed true to his roots. I mean, my dad, I mean, on the cover of the book, there's a glass of milk and that's a hat tip to, um, to my family. My grandparents were dairy farmers and my father was literally born on the farm. And so it, he taught me by example that, you know, the world is bigger than your backyard, but if you want to come back to your backyard, it's okay to do that too. Um, so he let me know that, that there was nothing I couldn't do. I don't think I realized how much of a cheerleader my father was until after he was gone. Um, because he's always so good at, at giving me a pep talk. And he and I, we would always say, give me the Reader's Digest version of the story. Because he and I could get, we, we get more accomplished in about a five minute conversation than most people can get done in a week sometimes. So it was just one of those things that he really instilled in me. And, you know, since he helped so many people, it made me want to emulate that. Um, I think one of the biggest examples for me, um, you know, I'm a big believer in signs and, um, the day after he passed, I went to the gym and I was coming back from the gym and I kept hearing a clanging and I was like, what the heck is that? You know, I'm in King city, Missouri population, 986 people, or I think it's 1013. Now we've had a few more added, but I was like, what is that clanging? And I looked up and the post office had put the flag at half mass for my father. After he so it's just like, to me, like things like that are just testaments to the kind of guy he was. But when he retired from, from being a general and we had a party and we had all of his different circles, I mean, people had no idea all the things he accomplished because he just always was this good guy. And he was such an example to, he could talk to dairy farmers and preachers, to dignitaries and senators. And I think that that's something that he passed along to me, knowing that people are just people at the end of the day and you just have to treat them as such. I love that. Um, as I mentioned, I, uh, I had an early preview of the book. And uh, so, so mine was in, in digital format. But if I had the actual paper copy, which I do love to read these type of books in paper, and I'm probably going to have to order it just so I have it for my bookshelf. But mine would have been marked up quite a bit and flagged because your dad was a big fan of sayings. Mm -hmm. And there was usually a lesson associated with some of the sayings. But I'd like to know what was your favorite saying he had that he said and why? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot, <laughs> but, um, but I think probably one of my most favorite sayings was the drive the car. So, you know, a lot of us kids that grew up in rural America or on, you know, on a farm or around a farm, we're all driving at a very early age. Um, you know, we, I, I think we were all behind the wheel before we were the age of 10, you know, even if it was just to drive down to the well sure. and turn on the water, you know, it was not a big deal. But then when it came to um, when we were doing formal driving on the highway, my dad, my dad had been a combat helicopter pilot and he was always, you know, wanted us to just remember to drive the car. It was almost a brainwashing thing. I mean, he would just be like, drive the car, drive the car, drive the car. And he would take the steering wheel and he'd jerk it and you'd start going off the road and you had to remember to keep your cool and to keep your focus and just drive the car. And he would always say, Hey, you could be the best driver in the world, but you have to be, you know, cognizant of your surroundings and the other people out there. And in rural Missouri, you could pop over a hill and I grew up around Amish people. So there could be a buggy, there could be a tractor, there could be a cow, there could be a horse. I mean, you just sure, never sure. knew. Um, so he just always said, you always have to be mindful of that. So that's been such a metaphor that I've come back to consistently because all it is about keep things simple. And so sometimes, you know, we can have these dragons, so to speak, that come in front of us and they can be so big and we can worry about how we're going to just tackle this obstacle. But if you, you know, break it down into bite size, you know, installments that you can make work for you and just remember the simple things first, like driving the car, then you can usually accomplish whatever you need to. And really, it's also about maintaining your focus. Absolutely. Um, I mean, drive the car, you have to pay attention to the car, not necessarily all the distractions that are trying to take you away from what you need to do. So I, I love that. Now, my personal favorite saying in the book, and I'm not, I think you might have mentioned to me, this actually didn't come from your dad, but it was still my favorite. And it was that there's three types of people in the world. There's owners, there's renters, and there's squatters. squatters. Mm -hmm. And we all need to get rid of the squatters <laughs> yeah. in our lives, whether it's personally or professionally. And I tell you, I just love that so much because it's so true. Yeah. There are people, we'll just use the squatters for a second, that just <laughs> take up space and they are an energy drain, whether it's in your personal life or it's your professional life. They're always taking and never give anything back. Yeah. So um, 
you included it in the book. So I feel like that must have had an impact on you as well. Yeah. So uh, that actually came from one of my best friends, John Beyond. He actually was a, a paratrooper in Desert Storm. And he's gone out uh, ahead to have like a very successful career. Um, he's been a, a director at MTV and Nickelodeon. And um, now he's actually doing uh, some different things for Capital One. Um, but I, he's always been such a go-to guy for me when it comes to staffing. Um, because he's managed a lot of staff. So when it was, I was trying to decide if I was going to let somebody go or how it was going to work. And he said, Susan, there's renters, there's owners, and there's squatters. And and he had gotten this from uh, somebody he served with in the military as well. And he said, look, he said, at the end of the day, he said, like you said, the squatters, they take up space, they drain you, they take everything, they don't really contribute to your business, your family, your society, or whatever. And then there's the renters that um, can be looked at more as, you know, the workers among workers. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, they come in, they do their job, they do their job well. And at the end of the day, they, they leave it all there. And then there's the owners. Doesn't mean you have to be the business owner, but you can take ownership of your career and ownership of what you're doing or ownership of the relationship. And so those are the people that, um, that really um, have like kind of the fundamental difference of, than the other two, because, you know, you have people that I call them intrapreneurs. So you can be within a company and still have ownership over your book, your schedule, your life, and really can contribute and treat the company as your own. Like you have ownership of it, even though you may not have a monetary ownership of it, but, you know, having relationships with people that are, that are renters and owners are typically uh, a lot more advantageous than the squatters. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. You know, that's something that um, I I believe and I've always said as well is that everybody should treat their job, their career as if it's their business, because it is. It's their livelihood. And just as we who actually own businesses and employ others, if they treat their career this, that same way, they're going to go so much further. And they they have then they have a value that others might want. I mean, you know, we've all had good people taken away from us or maybe people we brought in, but I think that anybody who treats themselves and their career with that ownership mentality is overall in a better place. Well, and I think too, like I always tell people when I have somebody come in and interview, I always ask them, are you looking for a job or are you looking for a career? Mm -hmm. These are two very, very different things. And if somebody's coming in and they're a producer, and they want to be, and they say a job, keep on walking um, yeah. because this is a career path. I mean, you and I both know, I mean, we've been in this industry for years and it's, it's an effort. It's a big effort. And so if you don't want this to be your career path and you're just biding your time, you can bide your time doing a lot easier things than this. Yeah, uh, that is a hundred percent for sure. Um, okay. So you mentioned it earlier, but see the signs is a theme mm -hmm. in your book. And I know, because I know you, I know how strongly you feel about this. So tell us what you mean. And other than your, your, you know, the clanging, what are some of the other signs you've seen? And then I'd love for you to also tell about the date your book was released and why that was so important. Yeah. So um, it's a little woo-woo, right? <laughs> it's not everybody's into this, but you know, I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of things in the universe we don't understand. You didn't make the sun go come up. I didn't make the sun come up. You know, there's there's things going on that are bigger than you and me. And so about a year after my father passed, um, one of my friends, Angela Ye, sent a book to me called Signs, The Secret Life of the Universe by a woman called, uh, named Laura Lynn Jackson. And she, that, if you've dealt with loss in your life, um, it, it just can be shattering. And, um you know, there's, there's so much, I think that we are just interconnected to people. And, um, I don't know about you, but, um, when my father passed, I mean, I used to be a voracious reader. I mean, I would read like a book a week, you know, book every couple of weeks. But when I went into a caregiving role, I had nothing else to give. And so I couldn't, I couldn't focus. I couldn't. And after my dad died, I had so many moving parts and so much, work that got put on my plate um, because, you know, my family, we have working farms and, and um, finances that I have to deal with for my mother. And I was dealing with the VA and Arlington and all this stuff. And it just, I, you know, reading for pleasure was not something that was 
that was going to be on my schedule right then. But a year after my father passed, um, my friend Angela sent me this book and it talked about signs and sign, getting signs from people that had passed and how you can ask for those signs. And if you ask for those signs, you can get those signs. So not saying that, you know, it could all be coincidences, but I had way too many coincidences to not believe that, that I get signs. So uh, some of the big signs that I get from my father are sunflowers are a huge one I get for him. And um, with everything going on in the Ukraine right now, and a lot of people posting pictures of sunflowers, it smiles to to make me think of my dad. Um, and then it also makes me sad to think about what a lot of those people are going through right now. But um, so the sunflowers are, you know, my dad was a farm kid and my, my dad behind the house planted these sunflowers and they were, oh, they were atrocious. They were nine foot tall sunflowers. My mother hated them when she would pull into the garage. I know she just like, it's like those freaking sunflowers. And, but my dad would, you know, he'd, harvest them. So with sunflowers, you chop the heads off, you dry them and you can take the, yes. the bird feed and, and feed birds. So my dad, my dad did that. So it just, uh, since he loved them so much and it just made me smile, sunflowers are always a big sign. So that's something that I get very frequently um, from him. I also, helicopters are a big one for me and my dad. Um, so I, since he was a helicopter pilot, so when there's a helicopter f flying over, um, but then I have some that are really kind of a little bit different. Like I have one called purple tiger <laughs> that I get, and that's a complex one. So if I'm having a hard day, I'm like, come on dad, I need, I need a sign. It's need something to show up. And the purple tiger is always a very creative one. I got that actually, um, one of the last times I went and visited him at Arlington and there was a wreath laying there and it was tiger, a wreath of tiger lilies and purple flowers. And so that was my purple tiger. So, um, so those are the things, I mean, not every, not everybody believes in them and that, and that's fine. I mean, that's, you know, that's, everybody's has the right to do those things. But, um, but I think if you're open to those things and willing to ask for those things, it just can keep that person that's passed just with you so much more. And, you know, I wasn't ready to, to lose my father in my thirties. And, um, so it's just been a way to still stay connected with him and still think about, you know, what would he tell me if I was doing this or, uh, different things. And I will tell you that the day that the book came out, my, um, my father's birthday is February 22nd. So that's the day the book was released this year, which was two twenty two twenty two. So if you, that's an angel number, if you believe in numerology and I get repeating twos, I get repeating numbers a lot from my dad. And so I, I don't think I even shared this with you, but um, when we were doing the Pancakes for Roger campaign, we have to log into social media all the time to pull the hashtags and to count up the pictures so that we can make the proper donation. And the day that the book released, I, in the afternoon, I just logged onto Facebook and a Facebook memory popped up that I've never seen pop up before. And it was from seven years ago and it was on my dad's birthday. And he was just, it was how the, the computer was situated. It was like, he was looking down and smiling at me, basically saying he was proud. And I, you know, it, it made me tear up. And then I took a picture of it and I sent it to my family and I went back and looked and the time was 2.22. Okay. Now you're going to get both of us. <laughs> uh, okay. So the book was born out of your love for your father, but also working through the grief that you experienced as a result of losing him. And one of the things that you do say is that you need to be proactive through the grief. What does that mean to you? And what can, how can those of us, rest of us that have lost people that we love use that as well? Yeah. So one of my favorite quotes by Marcus Aurelius is be active in your own rescue. And I think sometimes when we're going through grief, it can be very easy to just stand in the middle of the room and say, who's going to save me? Who's going to fix this for me? And sometimes we have to, you know, be our own hero and show up for ourselves and know that, you know, we have power in ourselves that can be greater than we even realize. And so one of the things that I found with grief um, that's helpful is helping others. Um, basically about a year after my father passed, I became a hospice volunteer. And that was a way to honor his legacy and also honor the people of hospice. They were so good to my family and were so supportive during that time. And by helping others, you get out of your head. And so I think sometimes, I mean, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I mean, I've, I've never struggled with depression. I've never had issues that way, but I've had a lot of friends that have, and I, I've had family members that, that struggle that way. And so not everything that works for me is going to work for somebody else. And I get that. But my, my dad and I were always the type of people that, you know, like move a muscle, change a thought. 
So, you know, if my dad was having a bad day, he'd go out to the farm, he'd go out to the farm, he'd cut wood, he'd, you know, mess around with the tractor, he would just get out of his own head. And so that's been something that's been very helpful for me. And I also think um, reaching out to others. Um, you know, people post on Facebook and on social media when they have lost somebody. Um, and I think that can be a very comforting thing. Um, but I, I typically don't respond publicly. I respond privately um, because I remember, you know, a lot of people saying things to me and, and it was so appreciative. But the most impactful things were those one-on-one kind of sidebars that I had with people because it was true and it was genuine. And I think until you, I think we can be very um, sympathetic people. But I really don't think until you go through a tremendous loss that you can't be truly empathetic until you've been in those shoes. I know that I was guilty of that. I mean, somebody would tell me that they lost their father and be like, oh, I'm so sorry. That's got to be hard, which fine. That's great to say. But I had no idea. I had no idea. And my message has shifted so much more since then. And it's recognizing that pain and seeing people for what they're really going through so that they can feel like they can share with somebody and have somebody that they can check in with if they need to. Yeah, um, I think one of the reasons that you and I connected so um, easily is that neither one of us has ever waited around for somebody to rescue us. But just because we have that personality doesn't mean that it's any less painful. And I think that that's one thing that sometimes people don't understand or see because they're like, oh, look they're handling it all just great. And so I think that comment that you made about being able to be truly empathetic to all sorts of different personality types, I think is really huge because not everyone has the ability to rescue themselves or to push mm-hmm. through. They they do fall into that, you know, I don't want to call it a trap because it's not, it's their own personal mental health abyss, if you will, mm-hmm. and how, how do they get out of it? And to have an honest one-on-one conversation with, this is how it felt for me. Mm-hmm. I have an inkling of what that must feel like for you, but why don't you tell me what you're going through? Mm-hmm. I think is so much more powerful and impactful than I'm sorry you're going through this. Yeah, It, it yeah. doesn't mean it's any less true because we are sorry that someone else has to go through it. And that's the only emotion we can express until you've actually experienced it yourself. But it is just very, very different. Well, and I mean, you have siblings too. I have two older brothers. Yeah. We all handle things much differently, right. much differently. I mean, a, a prime example is, you know, I remember the, um, the day I found out that my father had relapsed and, um, you know, my father had been diagnosed with Agent Orange related throat cancer about 10 years before he passed. And so, you know, we had 10 relatively good years and then the last year was just hell. And, when I got the call and my dad told me that he had relapsed, I mean, oh, I mean, I, I've never wanted to not get out of bed more, but I got out of bed because I had to go to Jersey and speak at a conference. You know, I had to show up for other people because that's what my dad would have done. And then one of my brothers called into work. So it's just, you know, everybody's different and everybody processes things differently. So you have to find the support system in the tribe that's going to support you in the way you need to be. And, but I think you also have to have an honest conversation with yourself and realize what you need. I mean, you know, Nancy, you and I are both type A and we're both very strong women. People forget to check on us. Yeah. yeah because when you have your stuff together and you're always spinning these plates and solving the problems and fixing everybody else's stuff, people are like, oh, they're fine. They're fine. And they don't remember to be like, hey, how are you? And when you say, hey, how are you? Man, we can just shatter like anything. <laughs> <laughs> like those are crying words right there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But that's the thing. You have to you have to know yourself. And I think a lot of times people just don't know themselves. Yeah. Well, you said you you gave me the perfect segue into my <laughs> next section because you mentioned having a tribe of people. Yeah. And I will call you the tribe leader because you created <laughs> this this community that um, has been going strong for almost two years now. Mm-hmm. And we call it the Wonder Woman Mastermind. And it, yeah. it, it sprung from something that you were doing anyway, um, writing a feature article on one or two people um, generally in the insurance um, industry and it was featured in, in a magazine. So tell me how you, or what prompted you to say, hey, this is great, but how do we actually do something more with it? Yeah. So, you know, when that article started, I mean, that article has been going on over five years now. Yes. And how that started was, um, you know, Paul Wilson, my editor at Benefits Pro, um, I would write about once a month for him. And he would always give me topics to, to write about and we kind of talk through things. And 
then one day he said to me, he's like, Susan, I just want something good. He said, there's so much, you know, turmoil in our industry and a lot of people unhappy. He said, I just want to hear some good news. And I was like, I got an idea. <laughs> so, you know, I was the um, national president of women insurance and financial services. And I had, had the privilege of meeting a lot of great women in our industry through WIFS and also through NAHU and, and uh, NAFA and NALBA and all the other letters. And I said, you know what, like women, if I'm going to stereotype and I will stereotype because I can, um, women can be horrible self-promoters and women can do great things. And sometimes, you know, we've been just programmed to be like, oh, well, don't brag about it. Don't brag about it. And so, but I can brag about it. So I started with, okay, let's reach out to this, with these women and say, what's been your biggest accomplishment in the past 12 months? And you can't talk about we, you can't talk about my company. This is about you. So it gets women a little bit outside their comfort zone. And so that's how the article series started. And then, like you said, a couple of years ago, somebody that had been featured said, hey, have you ever thought to, to do a mastermind? And, you know, I was coming up on a year of my dad passing and I was like, good Lord, do I really need one more freaking thing on my plate right now? And so I said, you know what, let's just send out an email to everybody that's been featured and see if there's interest. And then let's see where we can take this. So I sent out an email and, you know, Nancy answered the call <laughs> as, um, you know, a few other la you know, ladies did. I mean, we have Chelsea Wally and, and Susie Alberts and Serena uh, Jensen and uh, Christy Alexson. So they all, you know, connected with us and said, hey, you know what? It would be cool to do a mastermind of these wonderful women in our industry to share ideas and let's see where we can take this. So the five, six of us, six of us got together and we emailed everybody and said, okay, what topics would you like to hear? And it's been really cool because once a month we meet together, we, um, and it's not so much heavy lifting for each of us because we all rotate on who hosts it and we introduce a new topic. If it's a large meeting, we go into breakout rooms and it's just been one of the highlights of my month, I don't know about you, but I just really, really look forward to it because I know I'm always going to learn from other peer mentors and just get some knowledge and be able to go back to those women and ask about different tips. And um, we also get a lot of resources from it. So people talk about books or people talk about services or, you know, how they hired somebody. And it's just been so, so rewarding. Yeah, I agree. It's actually one of the highlights of my month too. And and I had no idea it was going to turn out that way. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you you know suggested it and I raised my hand like an idiot because I didn't have enough on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm so grateful that I did because it has really been it's been a um, real a, a foundation I think of my mental health through all the things that have gone on through the last couple of years because it's been crazy. It's not just pandemic and losing parents and everything else. It's everything else. Yeah. It's just been an absolute excuse my language, shit show. Um, <laughs> but, um, that's kind of, that's kind of what it's been, but we get in the, we get in that room and what kind of started out a little bit formal, we were a little bit more formal in the beginning and we become a little bit more informal. I don't think the value has decreased by any stretch of the imagination. If anything, it's increased because the trust level has increased. Yeah. Um, yeah. We really have this great space where we come together and we share great ideas, we share tips and resources, and we share challenges. Yeah. And that is just a, a beautiful thing. So I would say to anybody that does not have a tribe, and if you've got two or three of them, better yet, but I mean, you need a tribe of people to support you because it is tough going to do it all on your own. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, one of my biggest tribe has been, you know, may I call it our Wonder Woman board and it's, yeah. it's our task force members. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I shared before, we have our, our text thread. And if somebody's mm -hmm. like, I'm having a bad day, <laughs> then it's, yeah. you know, everybody rallies around and supports each other. And it's been so, so great for me too. It, it is. And, and, you know, just to, to expound on that for others that might be listening is, the more you give, the more you get. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we stepped up and said, okay, we're willing to put in the extra effort to facilitate this. And I'm so glad I did because I get so much from being a part of our, our board, our task force, as well as the larger organization. Okay. So are you ready for the five burning questions? Sure. Let's go for it. <laughs> okay. 
Number one question. Everyone gets it. It's tied to the name of the podcast. <laughs> what is your absolute favorite food in the world and can you cook it? And you can't say pancakes. Oh, no, it won't be pancakes. I suck at making pancakes, to be honest. Um, <laughs> you would think I'd perfect them by now because I have to have so many in February. Um, I'm a Missouri girl and I'm a barbecue girl. So, you know, I, I'm a big, you know, I'm a big, you know, uh, I'm not a pull, like I like pulled pork, but I'm like a good, you know, baby back rib girl and mac and cheese and collard greens and like all that good stuff. So I, I know you're not in Kansas City, but I'm assuming it's Kansas City style barbecue, like the saucy kind. Yeah. So, you know, like I, my, my brother was also a cancer patient at St. Jude Hospital in Memphis. So my family lived in Memphis on and off. And so, you know, I uh, don't want to hurt anybody from Missouri, but I'm also, I like some dry rub, you know, oh, uh, some yeah, Memphis. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just, so my family was like, I mean, you got to remember, like we, we were farmers too. So it's just like, so we want to taste our meat. So we don't oversauce yeah. things in my family. So my dad, um, my dad actually has a, had a really good rib recipe and I still, I still create that. So that, um, that's not, I can cook it <laughs> too. Nice. So. Okay. All right. So what's the character trait you most admire in other people and why? Tenacity. So in our office, we call that the ability to find the answer. And so with tenacity, I always think that sometimes, I mean, in different generations, we process things differently, right? And so I think sometimes with some of the younger generations, if they can't Google the answer, they throw their hands up and just say it can't be done. And you and I both know from our history that Google is great, but it's not the end all be all. So, you know, I always ask people, well, who can you talk to? Is there a manual? Is there a book you can read? Like, is how can you find the answer? So, you know, I thought that everybody had that because I have that. Um, and I thought it was just, just something people were born with. And it, it is something you're born with. And I don't, I don't know if you can really learn it. I think it's just very much a characteristic and a personality characteristic. And so it doesn't mean you have to be tenacious in all your roles in a company, but I think it drastically helps. It does. I would agree with that. So now if I turn the lens on you and I say, what is the character trait that you are most proud of in yourself and why? Uh, I mean, I'm tenacious. Um, if anything, I mean, that's, I, I think an example of that would be, um, you know, so I, man, I'm a spreadsheeter and my, um, I sat down with my dad, um, twice before he passed away. Once when he was going to have a, a very major surgery and we didn't know if he was going to be able to speak after that. And, um, and then again, when, um, we were bringing in hospice. And so after my dad passed, I went back and looked at the spreadsheets and, and, uh, one of the things on the spreadsheets was he wanted his dog at Arlington with him. <laughs> and my brother's like, yes, yeah, Suze, how are you going to do that one? <laughs> and I said, Hey, that's easy. I said, don't you guys understand? I'm now best friends with the County corner. I said, the dog's going to kick it before mom does. I was like, I'll get the dog cremated. I'll keep the ashes. I said, when mom kicks it, I said, I'll give the ashes to him. He'll shake him up. We put him in the box. They're in Arlington together. So I can, I'm really good at figuring things out. So um, and that's that's one of my strong suits when it comes to insurance too is like the um just figuring out complex things yep yeah i agree so um i do have to give a shout out to um it says you girls have been so much fun to listen to and i really enjoyed your conversation so if you've never watched this podcast before that's my mother so <laughs> <laughs> hi mom uh, so um what was your biggest challenge writing the book oh man i ugly cried about it <laughs> Every week. So maybe puffy eyes were my biggest challenge. Um, you know, I think, man, it, so it was very cathartic for me. It was very healing, but oh, it gutted me. It gutted me. And I don't think I was prepared for all the emotions. Like I, I think that, you know, I was so busy after my dad passed. I mean, I, I literally blocked um, family office time four hours a week in my calendar the first year after my dad passed away, because I knew there was going to be so much that I just needed to handle and things that came up for my mom with the farms, with Arlington, with the, the VA, like with everything. I mean, God bless my father, but eight properties and seven bank accounts. There's a lot of shit you got to clean up after that. And, um, you know, so when I was writing the book, I think that I, I didn't know how emotional it was going to be for me. Um, you know, I think that it was really, it helps with my grieving process because I think the first year I was numb and kind of on autopilot and then I started to feel more, but then it was like, okay, I, I needed to take care of everything else and make sure everything got done. So I, I don't think I, I realized how difficult it was going to be emotionally to get through, but I was, you know, I'm glad I did it. Good. Okay. 
So what's your secret talent or something people would be surprised to learn about you? I actually, my degree is in hospitality and I focused on culinary. So I'm kind of a hell of a cook. So I know. I know. <laughs> so I'm, and what I'm, I work as an expert witness a lot and they're like, Miss Combs, how does anybody know about insurance that has a cooking degree? <laughs> you know? And so, um, so that's one of the things that probably is one of my hidden talents that a lot of people don't know about. I love that. Okay, last question. Um, we'll speak to one of your passions, which is you know, we all know you're an avid CrossFitter. You are <laughs> you are a beast. Um, so what I'd like to know is what's your absolute favorite workout or workout of the day or however you have those funky little acronyms. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, I wouldn't say I have a specific favorite workout. I have a, probably some favorite movements. I am a chess a chess press or bench press queen. So that's one of my strongest movements. I'm at 185 pounds on bench pressing now. And um, most of the girls in my gym can't push more than 100 pounds. So I'm, I get to outlift a lot of the guys on that. So that's probably my strongest movement. And man, if I haven't signed up for the gym class that morning, and I see it on the workout, I'm, I'm moving my, my schedule around to show up for that. So that's one of my my favorite things to do that and push-ups. I can, I can do push-ups all day long. And I think that comes back from, you know, my father always working out and doing push-ups and things like that for the military. I love it. Well, thank you so much for um, coming on today. For anybody that's listening and is interested in um, purchasing the Pancakes for Roger book, um, it's available, of course, on Amazon. Any place else they can find it? Amazon would be the best place because you okay. can get it on Kindle. You can get hardcover. You can get softcover that way. And if you get it, please leave a review because that is very helpful to Susan. Um, and if you want to reach out to her for a potential speaking opportunity or to um, promote her book, what would be the best way for people to get a hold of you? You can just go to the website, pancakesforroger.com. Um, we have our, our media kit and everything. And, um, and this interview, interview will be up on there too. Okay, awesome. Well, I just appreciate you so much for coming on. Uh, I appreciate you as a friend. I appreciate you as an, um, a guest and everything that you do for everybody else in um, the benefits community and elsewhere. So thanks again, Susan. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Nancy. And for anybody listening, um, we will be taking a one-week pause next week and we'll be returning on March 24th. So I'll see you then.